Good morning, church. It is good to be here with you this morning. We please stand? And let's just uh, focus our hearts and worship our God. We serve an amazing God, amen? Oh, I know you're more awake than that. We serve an amazing God, amen? Oh, it is good to hear you this morning. Let's sing.
church. It is a good morning to be here. Got a new song for you this morning. Um, just talking about the good God that we serve and uh, his love and how he's created us just to to worship him and to praise him. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me all my days. I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been
the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my love be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness. Lord, that you are king, king of all kings, king above all. Lord, and in the darkest nights, you are there. In our overwhelming anxiety, you are there. In our victories, you are there. Lord, every good gift comes from you. Lord, and we praise you. Lord, we just ask, Lord, that this morning that our worship just was sweet music to your ears, Lord. 
We thank you that you're a God who bends down from his throne to hear our prayers. Thank you for Jesus. It's in his name I pray. Amen. Good morning, church family. I'm just going to sneak by here. <laughs> um, let me just tell you, um, there's a couple guys in the back that I don't, I don't talk about very much, but uh, they're here pretty early every Sunday morning. And there's some Sunday mornings, okay, <laughs> that their job is a lot more difficult <laughs> for them. And today was one of those days. And I just... I appreciate you guys back there. I appreciate you guys always serving, okay? And they're like, shut up, dude. Just shut up. But <laughs> that's why we're in the back, so we don't have to be in the front. <laughs> um, each week when we meet together at this time, we say our mission statement. We have narrowed it down to three words that have a much bigger meaning. I'm going to lead us in that now. Being, bringing, and building. Being a light, bringing others to salvation in Christ, and building disciples. As a leadership team, we've tightened a little closer around this. We want to serve your families well, so if there's a way that we can do that, that maybe is being overlooked, uh, share it with us. Uh, we do want to know. Uh, but just as importantly, uh, we want to partner and grow your ministries. We're always going to be challenging you, encouraging you. Maybe you like that word better. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> at this time to be uh, praying, God, what do you want me to do with my time, talents, and resources? What do you want me to be doing with those things? As you pray through those things and, and conviction and direction and purpose comes there, we want to know about that. We, want, we personally want you to share that stuff with us. We want to pray for it. We want to come alongside it and resource it, however that may be. Um, first through third graders, you guys can be dismissed. Um, in the back of the chairs in front of you are some connect cards. Uh, that's appropriate place if you want to connect with one of us. And this morning's not the time to do it or... Um, you don't know how to get a hold of one of us, uh, you can just jot that down uh, from Jamie or I to the elders. Um, that's a place that you can request, request prayer. That's a place that you can request to be added to our prayer chain. Um, you can do that as well online at DearingChristian.org. Um, those cards can be dropped in the lock boxes by the double doors on your way out, and that's also an appropriate place to give. Um, I got a few announcements today, and I'm going to try to uh, make my way through there. Um, as we... Um, go through our service. If you haven't joined us before, we will build up to communion. If you didn't grab a communion cup on your way in, uh, just raise your hand and one of us will get one of those to you. And then if you wouldn't mind uh, throwing away the trash in one of the trash cans on the way out, that would be awesome for the next service. Because I don't know, you, you first servicers, you guys get here early, you know, and you don't have to sit on the wet seats. And some, some have had to, you know, because we kind of shoot all these chairs down and try to clean everything, clean the bathrooms real quick as, you know, right at the end of the service for the next group coming in, just because, you know. We're trying, we're trying. Um, this next week, a couple of things uh, coming up that I want to talk about. Uh, solving the Mysteries of Marriage with uh, Bill and Lisa Ellis. That's going to kick off Wednesday night. And they, they told me, they said, we don't have marriage solved, okay? We're here to, to talk about the mysteries of marriage and possibly solve them together as a group, as a team. Um, Wednesday, uh, February 10th, over at the coffee shop, there won't be any child care. 7 o'clock, this, uh, this is not a lifelong commitment, okay? Marriage is a lifelong commitment. <laughs> this class is about six weeks long. So six weeks, um, it's, it's, from what I've heard, it's a lot of fun, okay? That's what I've heard from various different people, that, that, it, was, that it was challenging, that it was encouraging, and that it was a good time of fellowship together. Um, hymn scene would typically be taking place tonight. It's not going to take place tonight. It's going to take place next Sunday night. So if you're part of that, you're looking for that information, next Sunday night, uh, Valentine's weekend, that'll be taking place. Um, let's see, a couple more things. Um, you know, we've been talking about the Core 52 books, and many, many of you, many of us, I'm glad I got mine like a year ago because there's none left right now. And so we've ordered some, um, but if you look in the back, you'll see, uh, you'll be running back there and be like, I haven't got a book yet. And then today you'll be sad because there's just a picture of a book. That's all. We're so close, so close. But uh, next week they'll be back there, um, and you can look for them there. Um, there's a very cool website that uh, goes along with that, core52.org, and um, if you uh, just, just want to stay caught up and you don't have it, you can uh, go to that website, check out what's going on there. There are actually videos that go along um, with the stuff, and I had a good question about Core 52, so just a little uh, question answer. Somebody said, 
I got to the back. I, I read my chapter. I've been reading my chapters, but I don't. Then I get to the end, and it's like, okay, now do the essay. You know what? I don't know why they put that deal at the end of the chapter. That was bad organization to me, okay? That needed to be at the beginning of the chapter, and that would sure helped us all out, you know? Like, because you've already read the thing, and then you get to the end, it's like, read the thing, and you're like, that's how I got here. <laughs> so it should have been, you know, hindsight, I don't know, that's a bit out of organiz organization to me. Um, so anyways, if that's you and you've been trying to figure out, what is this? That's, what, that's what's going on there. Um, all right, uh, one more, one more thing, I th think, and then we got a little video, right? Are you ready for that little video? You want to do it real quick? See, I, we had, we had a moment back there this morning. We had about 45 minutes of a moment. <laughs> um, yeah, a little something from the Faith Cove. So, you know, there's some stuff going on back in the back, but I don't know about you, but anytime I watch a kid do memory work, it's like trying to feed an infant. Like, I, if I know the memory work, you know, <laughs> if you ever tried to feed an infant, you know, and you're opening your mouth with the spoon, is there, I don't know, maybe it was just me, I don't know. But that's how when I watch kids do memory work, I'm like, <laughs> trying to, you know. Um, one last thing, and I'm going to get out of your faces and turn things over. Um, we have, uh, we've, we've had deacons implemented here for um, a couple of years now. Uh, this part of this last crew, they've been on for quite a while and through kind of, a, kind of an interesting season. And, and part, part of them, their responsibilities are kind of coming to, to an end uh, with that particular uh, position right now. And so we're just going to, we're kind of putting this out here just like we have done in the past. Um, so we're looking for deacon nominations. It is a uh, year-long commitment. Um, and this is kind of how we do that here. Uh, we ask for our church body uh, to submit names that they feel like are qualified from God's word, that they're willing to put in writing and sign themselves, and that are not family members. And so if you, if you look around and you see somebody, you're like, I, I believe this person is, a, is qualified. I believe that this person, this person ha is worthy of this and needs to be part of this, and they... they they seem like servant leadership to me. Um, just go ahead and jot that down, and you can submit that to Jamie or I or one of the elders. Guys, we are so glad you're here. I'm excited for a new new sermon series. So we're rolling into something new today. So good morning. All right, everyone, the good life. 
the good life. I think there's a, people who would define that in different ways, quite possibly. But my guess is that in the end, um, even if the pictures might look different, the idea of it and what's behind it is probably quite similar. And that might be even a worldwide type of thing. I don't know that for sure. I'm, I'm kind of a guy in the middle of the Midwest of the United States of America. Uh, but uh, I do know that, that if you brought that, that thought, that phrase, and what's behind it up to people of the world, their mind's going to go certain directions with it. What, is the, what does the God's word have to say about the good life. That's where we're going to be diving in for the next six weeks. Um, today, we are going to bounce around this a little bit. We're going to start in the Gospel of John. It'll be the fourth book of your New Testament. It starts with Matthew, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you want to turn to John, um, about chapter 3, chapter 4, we're going to look at that a little bit. And, and we're not going to stay there the whole time, but that is where we're going to spend the majority of our time and um, if you'd like to follow along, that would be great. Anytime that you hear me reading from God's Word today, I'll be reading from the New American Standard. That's also what will be up on the screen behind me. There are a lot of good versions of the Bible out there. If that's not exactly what you have, that's okay. If it looks a little different, that's okay. Um, but I just want to make sure that you're aware of that so it doesn't throw you off. Well, wait a minute. That's not what my Bible says. All right. So um, um, the, the gist of, of most of what we have, if your Bible says version on it, um, then that would make it a translation, but sometimes they look just a little bit different occasionally. So, that being said, let's ask for God to jump right in here in the middle of this with us, and uh, let's, let's dive in together. Would you pray with me, please? Lord God, we come before you this day, and we thank you, Father, for um, the gift of your word. Lord, there's not a one of us in this room who doesn't desire a good life. Help us in the coming weeks to come to a greater understanding of what that means and how you want to be involved as an active player, as the acting, driving force behind our lives, how we live, the choices we make, how we represent ourselves and you to the world, Lord. We pray, Father, that as we dig into this topic these next few weeks, today especially, that you would be in our journey through your word. And if there is something that needs to change in our lives, whether it is a behavior or simply a frame of mind or an attitude, Lord, we pray that by your spirit you would correct us and put us on the path that you desire for our lives. Even if that means drastic change taking place. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, I, I, I'm not. I'm not a twit, all right? Um, I'm not a tweeter. I don't get on Twitter. I don't do it. Never have. Never will. Just it's, it's, not, it's not me. But I know enough about it to know that there is something called the hashtag. A hashtag for me will always be a pound sign. It's a pound sign, people. I don't, where'd you even get this hashtag business? That pound sign doesn't go at the beginning, it goes at the end. You got 220 and then a pound sign, a pound sign. That means that you shot a 220 pound buck, all right? That's what it means. So throw your ha hashtag 220 pound, all right? Eat on that and chew on it a while. To me, it'll never get that way. But that's not the majority of the world around us in which we live. Um, there's hashtag all kinds of things out there. And you know a hashtag that has gained traction somewhat recently. And by seeing somewhat recently, it's been around for a little while. But it's this, hashtag blessed. You seen that before? I, I, I just typed it in, you know, on my little search engine and, and pulled it up. Oh, my goodness. T-shirts, sweatshirts, coffee mugs, wall hangings, you name it. I mean, all over the place. And also, when you, when you see this, this hashtag blessed, something else that you're going to find is it sometimes shared with various images on social media. 
And these images, much like the images we just had on the screen behind me right now there as we watch our our intro into the messages for the next few weeks, um, you know, you've got you've got a new baby with hashtag blessed, but you've, you've got a picture of new baby. You've got, you got somebody on vacation, hashtag blessed. New house, hashtag blessed. New car, hashtag blessed. I even saw a guy pressing 300 pounds, and I think he got it wrong. It was supposed to say hashtag pressed, but he put hashtag blessed, and I was like, Okay, all right. So you've got all of these things out here, and this is this this hashtag has grown incredibly popular. You know, we we looked um, at the topic of blessing by God a couple of weeks ago. I hope you remember that. And and what we looked at is we looked at that how the Hebrew and Greek words behind blessed, there, there's, there's a word back there, and, and, and the Hebrew word was esher, and how many, many times you would see that word in the Old Testament used in our English translation, the backing of that was the Hebrew word esher, which means happy. But what I don't want you to misunderstand is that every time you see blessed in the Bible, that is the Hebrew or the Greek word behind it, because there are other Hebrew and Greek words that are sometimes translated as bless in our Bibles. A little more on that in just a little bit. So, blessed, it's been around a long time, this thought process. You will see it near the very beginning of the Old Testament. We're talking millenniums that this idea of being blessed has been around. And us as Christians, and Christians are defined in this, followers of Jesus Christ, Us as Christians should always connect the idea of blessed with Christ. But here's the thing. When he came into this world as a human being, he radically changed the idea of God's blessing and what that looks like. To show this, we're going to look at two different encounters of Jesus from 3 John or not 3rd John, from John chapter 3, I'm going to be, I'm going to be careful here, I'm going to confuse you, because there is a 3rd John, but John chapter 3 and John chapter 4. The very first encounter we see with Jesus in John chapter 3 could quite possibly be called the picture of blessing, okay? This encounter, you've got, you've got this encounter of Jesus where a man sought him out. It wasn't Jesus seeking someone out. It was a man seeking Jesus out to have a conversation with him. We're going to read about that beginning of John chapter 3. First couple of verses here. This is what it says. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, We know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. One of the things that bounces off of the page in this to me is the thought process of we. Nicodemus does not just use himself in the first person pronoun, he uses it in a plural sense. So it wasn't just Nicodemus who knew that Jesus was from God. And I'm assuming he's talking about some of the other Pharisees, religious leaders, priests, right? So we have this guy, he is a Pharisee, he's not just a Pharisee, he's a ruler amongst the Jews. That tells us that he is a high-ranking Pharisee. This is the guy that the regular Jews out there of Jesus' day would look at and say, that's a blessed man right there. I mean, this guy was up here in the religious hierarchy. He has, this guy's got to be a blessed man. Now, he has, he seeks out Jesus, and they have a conversation. Jesus dominates this conversation, which, which happens oftentimes, you know, because people like to hear what he's going to say, especially one who's seeking him sincerely. And, and Nicodemus comes, and, and Jesus gives Nicodemus in this conversation three major claims that we could tie to the idea of being blessed by God. Three of them. The first one is this. Blessing comes from being a part of God's kingdom. Now, this would not be outrageous to Nicodemus. He would understand this fully. 
all right? God's kingdom, if you are a part of it, that means blessing is there. It is a blessing just to be a part of it. This is not outrageous. This is not way out there. This is nothing brand new. So Nicodemus is like, right on. I understand what you're saying here. Ah, and then Jesus goes on, and it starts to throw something into this that Nicodemus has never thought about before. Number two, claim of Jesus. Only those who are born again can be a part of God's kingdom. Now, I'm going to read the words for you from Jesus rather than just summarizing them. This is verse 3 of John 3. It says, Jesus answered and said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, this is how Jesus starts the conversation. Boy, get right to the nitty gritty right off the bat. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born again when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? And Jesus said, Answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, capitalized Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Right here in Jesus, this is a very early conversation of Jesus, early in his ministry. I mean, this is right as things are starting to get rolling here. And he's having this conversation with Nicodemus. And Jesus, right there, I mean, he is a prophet. We're going to see that in the next encounter, but we knew that already. He he makes incredible direct, a direct connection to what is going to come about three years later on the day of Pentecost when the church would begin. This idea of of being born of the water and the spirit, it just kind of reminds me of something that one of Jesus' followers would say when they were asked, what do we do? They preached the gospel sermon. The, those who heard, not all of them, but many of them were cut to the heart. And they say, what do we do? That guy that we put on the cross, he's alive again. He's God's son. What do we do? And Peter said to them, see if this sounds anything like what Nicodemus is told by Jesus. Peter replied and said, Let you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. What? That you might receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is is pointing towards what is yet to come. This being born again isn't about, no, Nicodemus, you don't have to enter your mother's womb. All All right. This being born again is something completely and entirely different. And Nicodemus is still just kind of scratching his head. He doesn't understand it. And Jesus is like, how can you not understand these things? You're a teacher of Israel. So that is the second claim. Now, the third claim, now, it's not as quite as difficult to understand, but it is an outrageous claim in that day and in that time. And it's this. Jesus, his title is Christ. That's, that's what he was. He was the Messiah. And he is the only pathway to the Father. To us, that sounds quite normal. That's what we believe. To Nicodemus, this is something entirely brand new, even though the Old Testament talks about it quite often, and he should have known something about it. So, as Jesus continues in this conversation with Nicodemus, it's not a long conversation. Of course, it might have gone on quite a bit longer than what we get. We might just have the the summation of it here. But as you look through about, through, about halfway through the chapter 3 there, what you will see is Jesus summing up his conversation with Nicodemus in this way. He's saying, blessing comes from being in the light. If you want to be blessed, you've got to be the light. And then Jesus pretty much makes it clear that he is the light. But the majority of the world will always prefer the darkness. You know why? It's so much easier to hide. Are you ever in, in a play or a musical or anything like that? We got some, we got some actors or actresses out there. Um, I can remember back in the back in the day in high school, the dark ages. My brother-in-law would say, um, being in in a in a musical each and every year. My freshman year, Sound of Music, and my mom, oh man, she was in heaven. Her favorite movie musical of all time, and her son. Is one of them. Of course, I was just one of the kids. I didn't have a big role. I was the only kid 
probably the only boy in the county who could still hit that high note of good night, so long, farewell, that whole song business, you know. Uh, anyway, anyway. So, but you know this, if, if you're someone who doesn't like to be in the spotlight on the stage, you're kind of back here, all right? And, and, and it's like, just, just keep me out of that spotlight, don't want to be there, there's no way to hide right there, all right? It is so much easier to hide who we are in the darkness, rather the light, and for that reason, the majority of the world hates the light and reside in the darkness. And Jesus makes it clear, if you want to be blessed, you've got to be with me, because I'm the light. All right, so that is the first encounter of Jesus. The second one, that first one was like a picture of blessing. That's what most people think when they saw Nicodemus. The second one, a little different, picture of misery. I mean, that, that really, really would, would describe it quite well. In the second encounter, and you can look at it, church is one page over maybe, you might already be there, John chapter 4. And this time, it is not somebody seeking out Jesus, it's Jesus seeking out someone. Jesus took the initiative to engage in this conversation. We're going to be reading in John chapter 4, beginning with verse 7. This is what it says. And guys, this is, just, this is shortly after Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. Just days later. And this is what happens. Jesus is in near Sychar, the city of a city in Samaria. Verse 7, there came a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone into the city to buy food. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I'm a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. This woman was probably a little bit unnerved when she just walked to the well, hopefully going to be there alone. There's a reason why she was going at the time of day, noon, when nobody else would be there. And there's this guy sitting there, and not any guy, it's a Jew. And he's like, oh, man. And she goes, and she gets, she gets her water, and, and this, this Jewish man begins a conversation with her. This is like obliterating the rules. This, this is not supposed to be. Jews and Samaritans hate each other, all right? And even in common company of people that you didn't despise, men didn't speak to women in that public of a sense in this way in that time. Yet Jesus starts this conversation. This poor woman is an outsider in more ways than one. She's not just a Samaritan. Um, as we'll see, there's other things here in her life that would put her in the outsider encampment. So they have a conversation. The conversation starts with water. Jesus asks her for a drink. She says, how is it you're talking to me? You're not supposed to be. And then, and then Jesus says, her, well, if you knew who I was talking to, you would ask me for a drink of living water, which living water is like water. It's moving water. It's alive. It's like water from a spring or water from, from a stream. I mean, it's much better than something in a stagnant place. And, and he says, if you knew who, you, who asked you for water, you would ask him. If you knew who he was, you would ask him for living water. And she's like, well, what about, tell me more about this living water. Conversation continues. Jesus says, if you want me to tell you more about what this is about, go get your husband and come back. She says, I don't have a husband. He says, I know you don't have, have a husband. You've had a bunch of husbands, and the guy you're living with now isn't your husband. And she changes the conversation very quickly. She says, uh, you're a prophet. <laughs> very uncomfortable conversation here. Do you not see? They get into a conversation about worship. And she says, now your people say you're supposed to worship in the temple. We can't go to the temple. We say that you're supposed to worship on this mountain right here. Which is the right place to worship? And Jesus continues on. And Jesus says, he says, a day is coming. When the door to the kingdom of God, remember the kingdom of blessing, the kingdom of God will swing wide open and a dot on a map will not matter anymore. It won't be about the temple. It will not be a mountain. It will be about what's on the inside of a person, their heart. And he says, and God will be worshipped in spirit and in truth. And this leads her to say, well, I know that the Messiah is coming one day. And when that happens, everything that you're talking about 
will come true. And Jesus looks at her and he says this. And this is shocking. This is early in the ministry of Jesus. Understand this. He's not letting it be known to hardly anybody, nobody publicly, who he is. But he looks at this woman, this Samaritan woman, and he tells her, the one you speak of, it's me. I am he. So early and yet in, in the way of things of Jesus, and he tells this woman exactly who he is. And then she goes back to the city, leaving her water pot, all right? She returns back to the city and tells them, I know I have met the Savior of the world. Jesus ends up spending two days with that town, that Samaria, teaching the message of the kingdom. And by the end of it, the people of the community said this, now we know for ourselves. We don't even know her name, woman, (laughs) that this man is the Savior of the world. There's not a, there was not a Jew alive besides Jesus in his day who would have said that this Samaritan woman of ill repute was blessed. But Jesus said otherwise. And wouldn't you like to know when it comes to this woman, the Paul Harvey rest of the story? Because that's all we hear. We don't, we don't hear much more about her. I really wonder if... if Three and a half, four years later, if she heard the message from a guy named Philip who came into Samaria and began preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. You can read all about it in Acts chapter 8. It's quite a story. So from these first two encounters, we see this. Jesus is the light. Jesus is the living water. Blessing comes through him. But here's the deal. We looked at two encounters, but there's something sandwiched between these two encounters. So now I'd like you to look once again to the end of John chapter 3. And what we're going to see is a picture of decline. You have Nicodemus, you have the Samaritan woman. And in between those two people, we have none other than John the Baptist. Let me tell you a little bit about John the Baptist. These are some of the things and titles. These are some of the things that that go behind his name. You know, the credits, the all the alphabet letters, you know, PhD, blah, 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 all that stuff. These this is some of this is some of the things that, that John the Baptist could put on his resume. The forerunner of Christ, the last messianic prophet, powerful preacher, fearless. How about this one? The greatest born of women. That's a bunch of people, (laughs) okay? There aren't too many people who come into this world who weren't born of woman. I can only think of one, and his name was Adam, all right? Everyone since then got here the same way, born of a woman. And what did Jesus say about this guy? The greatest of all. So let's look at it a little bit. The end of John chapter 3, and what we see taking place here is Johnny B's, old John the Baptist, his followers, his disciples, because he too was a teacher and a rabbi, and rabbis would gather disciples around him, around them, and he was just that. And his disciples were concerned about the rising popularity of this Jesus guy. They're like, you baptized that guy a while back now. His his followers are baptizing people. He's preaching the good news. And guess what? They're We got a problem here, John. We got to figure this out. And this is John's response to them. Again, John chapter 3, beginning in verse 27. This is how John answers them, their concern. He says this John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. And then catch verse 30. This should be the action statement. 
the definition of the life of every follower of Jesus Christ. He must increase, but I must decrease. You know, when you think of decline, it's not usually something that we think of in a positive sense. The decline of a civilization, the decline of, of an environment, the decline of the morality of a person or a civilization or a nation. I mean, it's just not something that we think of in any way whatsoever in a positive way. Let me tell you something about John the Baptist and about Jesus. When Jesus spoke that, that he is the greatest, there is, of those born of women, there is no one greater than John the Baptist. Jesus did not say this about him when John was out baptizing in the Jordan. It wasn't then that Jesus gave him the title greatest. You know what was going on in John's life when Jesus gave him that title? This, he was in prison, he was alone, and he was frustrated. That's John the Baptist. And then John the Baptist sent his disciples to Jesus asking, Are you the one? Are you really the one that we have been expecting? He's been in prison. John the Baptist. Because like I told you, he's fearless. And part of his fearlessness led him to make a, <laughs> a pretty, pretty big accusation against King Herod. And what was taking place in that, in that palace, the marital relationship wasn't right. Because of his taking a stand about that, he's in prison. Jesus out here, his ministry is growing, things are booming. John's in prison. He sends the disciples to say, are you really the one that we have expected? Let's take a look at it. Turn over to Matthew. Matthew chapter 4. We're going to see Jesus, or Matthew, I, I apologize, Matthew chapter 11. I, turn, I was looking at verse 4 and I'm turning to Matthew 11. Turn to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 4 is when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. A little earlier than this. All right, look at Matthew 11, beginning with verse 4. This is Jesus' response to the followers of John who came with their questions. Jesus answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised up. And the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who does not take offense at me. Jesus sends back his, the disciples of John and he says, yes, I am the one. Report to, report to John, not just what you hear me say, but what you see taking place. The lame walk, the deaf hear, the blind see, the lepers are cleansed, the dead are raised. The gospel is preached to the poor. That's what I'm here for. Yes, I am the one. And then he follows it with this, with this mild rebuke to say, blessed is the one who doesn't trip up over me. And the reason I know that that was just a, a mild little rebuke, it's a tiny little kick in the seat of the pants to John, is this, because it's after that, and after the messengers, the disciples of John leave, that Jesus makes his glowing statement about John being the greatest of those born of women. You see, the world would never see John the Baptist sitting in prison awaiting his coming execution. They would never see the picture of that and throw a hashtag blessed on it. <laughs> they wouldn't. They'd see that picture and it's a picture of decline. But here's the thing. God sees the world much differently than we do sometimes. Do does our vision of what it means to be blessed by God 
need transformation. You see, the blessing of this kind does not revolve around circumstances. It doesn't. Brothers and sisters, it's not a bad thing to desire a wall at the house with some pictures of incredible memories. It's it's not a bad thing. But it's not truly what life is all about here. Because those pictures so often represent circumstances. The blessing of God doesn't revolve around circumstances. It revolves revolves around our Lord. There's a guy in the Bible that his story has, has puzzled us for generations, for millenniums, okay? His name was Job. And don't misunderstand the timing of Job, even though we find it in the middle of our Old Testament. It happened very, very early, okay? I mean very early. We're talking, this is the Genesis story, all right? I've never understood what was going on in Job. I haven't. I don't think it's our job to understand it. It's our job to read it and try to learn from it. So let's turn back there. I told you we're going to bounce around just a little bit. You will find it right in the middle, right before the wisdom literature of Psalms, all right? Job chapter 1. Turn there. If you're not exactly sure where that's at, look it up in your table of contents. It'll put you in the right place. We're going to be here for just a second. You'll have time to get there before we're done. I have a question for you. When it comes to Job, and if we were going to throw the old hashtag blessed onto Job here, where would you put it in chapter 1? Would you put it at the beginning of the chapter or the end of the chapter? I'm going to read a couple of passages from you. And just, just think about where you would throw hashtag blessed. All right. We're going to begin... Chapter 1, verse 1. Read the first three verses. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless, upright, fearing God and turning away from evil. Seven sons and three daughters were born to him. His possessions were also 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. And that man was the greatest of all the men of the east. Sound like a hashtag blessed? Oh, yeah. That's a hashtag blessed right there, I'm telling you. Throw it on him. Wear it with pride. Get that man a t-shirt. Throw it over his tunic, okay, because he can wear it. All right. Now let's fast forward to the end of this chapter. Let me tell you what's happened since this time. Every one of his children are dead. His livestock is gone. His possessions raided. And let's see what comes next. Chapter 1, verse 20. Then Job arose. He tore his robe and shaved his head. And he fell to the ground and worshipped. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb. And naked I shall return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Through all of this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. Okay, so we've got Job on the ground. His clothes torn. Hashtag blessed. Job said something there. And his trials aren't over, by the way. There's still yet more to come. Job says something, he worships the Lord, and his worship is comprised of something along these lines. He says, blessed be the name of the Lord. I told you at the beginning of this sermon that that word blessed, what we have in our Bible 
that says blessed is many times representing different words in the Hebrew and the Greek. When we looked at blessed a couple of weeks ago from the wisdom literature and some of the Psalms of King David, the word blessed was backed up by the Hebrew word esher. Remember what it means, happy. The word used by Job here is not esher. It's barak, B-A-R-A-K. And what it means is this, to kneel. Understand something, brothers and sisters. The man or woman or child wise enough to kneel before God in all times of life is truly blessed. Job's world had been ripped from him, and he's on the ground worshiping his God. And because of that, he is blessed. You know why? Because of the God that he's worshiping, the God who sees our suffering and saw the suffering of Job. He understands our suffering. There's something that we have that Job didn't have. This is part of our history as followers of Jesus. We are living in a completely different time than Job. And you know what made the difference? We call it the passion of Christ. That's just a nice way of saying the suffering of Christ. We serve a God who knows firsthand what it is to suffer. Who do you think suffered more on the day that Jesus was on that cross? Jesus or his father? Moms and dads out there, what would be more difficult for you? Enduring suffering or watching your child endure it? God suffered, God the Son suffered, God the Father suffered. Our God understands suffering. He doesn't just sympathize, he empathizes. And he, through Christ, has provided the antidote to suffering. I meet with a group of guys, a small group, every Wednesday morning, and we read through God's Word. You know what we got to read through this past week? We're in Revelation. We've made our way through the Bible, and we're about time to start over again. And we read through Revelation chapter 6. And you know what it says there? It talks about the antidote of our God to our suffering. That comes through Jesus Christ. And I'll read it for you. They will hunger no longer nor thirst anymore. Nor will the sun beat down on them. Nor any heat. For the lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd. And will guide them to springs of the water of life. And get this. And God will wipe every tear from their eyes. The tears of his blessed people. Brothers and sisters, we need to be very, very careful about how we define the blessing of God. Because it has less to do with our circumstances than we probably understand. And it has more to do with God who's there with us in the midst of wonderful times and horrible times. And one day, brothers and sisters, he will dry the tears of his people forever. Do you understand what that means? That's not just talking about Jesus standing there with his father with a giant Kleenex box, okay? It's talking about an end to suffering and evil and hurt and pain. It's gone. It's over. It is ancient history one day. And that's what God has for his people through Jesus Christ, his son. We're coming to our time of communion. And in that time, 
us just remember what our God has done for us. Have you suffered? There are people in this room who have suffered more than others. I don't even know how you quantify that. And there is some suffering that some of you have experienced in this room that I can empathize with, but a lot of it that I can only sympathize because I've never experienced it. So the comfort that I try to give can only go so far. But our God understands suffering. And it's to him we go in those times. He's there for us. Always. And that's something very much to be thankful for. I'm going to give you some time in communion. I'm going to pray for us. You can spend that time alone with your Lord. You can spend it with your family, with the Lord. I don't know how you want to do that. But focus for a little while on that cross. Because without that cross, we have no hope. Without that empty tomb, we have no hope. But our God has given us hope through what he's done for us and the future he's preparing for us even as we speak now. Let's thank him for it. Would you pray with me? Father, we come before you and we thank you for your goodness, Father. We sang about it this morning. We heard about it from your word. You are good. When life isn't good, you're still good. And we thank you, Lord, that our future is secure in you. And we thank you, Father, that one day suffering will be nothing more than an ancient memory. But until that day comes, Lord, strengthen us by your Son and by your Spirit to endure. We pray this in the name of Jesus. you please stand with me? You know, brothers and sisters, it's kind of interesting um, when you when you hear people's story, because that's that's supposed to be part of our message. It is our, our testimony, how, how we came to know Jesus, his 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 um, what he has done in our lives. Um, that, that's part of how we testify of, of him to the world. I mean, that's not all of our testimony. All of our testimony, we, we also get a lot of it from here, but, but it is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and it affects us in a very personal way. And it's interesting when you talk to people, especially people some, a little bit later in life, how oftentimes difficulty in life played a major role in bringing them to Jesus. That's the story of a lot of people. Um, C.S. Lewis put it in in an amazingly poetic way because he was just good at that when he said that he said that God whispers in our pleasures, but he screams in our pains. It is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. So it's, it's amazing how this can change perspective. But here's the thing. If you were on the outside of that you can never understand it fully. All right? And Jesus, what he said in those first two encounters is very true. Blessing comes through him and him alone. He is the only way to God. And if you've never laid your life down before the foot of the cross, you've never gotten in those waters of baptism as it talks about in Jesus' words to Nicodemus, as a prophecy of what would take place on the day of Pentecost. What are you waiting for? Be made new through the person of Jesus Christ and change your life. All right. Give yourself the strength through the Spirit of God to walk in this world even in the difficult times.
Okay? You weren't made to walk through those times alone. You weren't. Okay? All right. That being said, everyone, this week we're going to be looking at blessed, and you can find that in Core 52, Chapter 18. Chapter 18. So if you're, if you're working through that with your family or by yourself or in a small group, that's a chapter to be looked at this week. That's where the essay, as JV was talking about, is found, um, and work your way through that as well. There's pretty interesting this week. I looked at the activities, and they have one about going to the voice of the martyrs which um, you can go to that. It's, it's, a, it's a, a platform to get, the, to get the truth out there that there are people suffering for their faith in Jesus Christ in our world today. And there are stories there about people and their triumphs of faith through difficult times, some of them even giving their lives for the name of Jesus Christ. And, and people who are suffering our world right now, and part of the, of the assignment, if you will, is to read some of those stories and pray for some of those people who are experiencing persecution in our world for the name of Jesus Christ. We're never told to pray the persecution stops, but if you look at the scripture, we're to pray that they would stay strong in the midst of it. So, some interesting um, activities this week. Chapter 18. Um, It's good to see you all. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you so much for who you are and who you've called us to be. And Lord, we thank you that... um, that the good life is available through Jesus to us. What an amazing, amazing promise for our future and our present life today. Lord, help us to go into this world around us, whether it be our place of work, whether it be our schools, whether it be our homes, and all the places between those places, Lord, representing you well. Help us to do that this week. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Have a good day, everyone.